So good afternoon. Well, thanks for joining us. I hope everyone enjoyed a long weekend in recognition of Labor Day. Uh, Susan and I joined Montanans on Monday in celebrating all those who work hard every day. I might note the people in this room as well. So thank you. Uh, and thanks to our just get her done Montana work ethic and our pro-business, pro-jobs policy, uh, Montana's economy is on the move. Do we have a copy of our report? Um, so, uh, the findings of the Montana Department of Labor and Industries annual Labor Day report show us just that. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined today by leaders and experts who can give us a glimpse into our economy and the impacts of the policies that we've adopted here in Montana. I'm glad to be joined today by DLI Commissioner Sarah Swanson, uh, our state economist, Amy Watson, who's available to answer any technical questions you may have, and Dave Smith, the Executive Director of the Montana Contractors Association. Thank you for being here today. Each year, DLI produces its annual Labor Day report to provide a detailed view of Montana's economy as measured by key economic indicators like job growth, wage growth, and other economic outputs before I dive into the findings of this year's report, allow me to highlight just a couple of facts about our economy since my administration took office. Montana's unemployment rate is in a record stretch, remaining at or below 3.4% for 37 consecutive months. Uh, we delivered also the largest tax cut in state history uh, to Montana homeowners and Montanans at every income level. Last year, as a result of our policies, we saw a record number of nearly 60,000 new businesses that were created in Montana, surpassing the previous record, which was just one year before in 2022. It's clear now, more than ever before, that we needed new leadership to unlock Montana's full outstanding potential. And I'm incredibly proud of the progress that we've made working together with the team. So to all of our partners across Montana, thank you on these terrific results. Now let's dive into this year's report. And let's start with a look at our labor force. In 2023, our labor force reached a record high of 580,000 people, the highest ever on record with more than 10,000 additional Montanans entering the labor force last year alone. Our job growth kept pace with available labor, adding 8,700 uh, 8, jobs last year alone. That puts Montana, and this is noteworthy, as a top 10 state in the nation for fastest employment growth since 2020. But I think the best news comes in our wage growth. In 2023, the average wage in Montana reached over $57,000 per year. And get this, that ranks Montana as the second in the nation for fastest wage growth. Even better, Montana is only one of two states where wage growth has outpaced inflation since 2020. That means that even in the face of still high inflation from the current administration in Washington, Montana's dollars go further, helping better afford gas, food, and other essential goods and services. To round out the other indicators from the report, we've got our group of experts here who will take a deeper look into this snapshot Thanks to the support we've provided Montanans as business owners through the Montana Department of Labor and Industry, and thanks to the leadership of Commissioner Swanson, we can celebrate these wins here today. Commissioner, would you please share a little more about the findings and what it means? Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Governor Gianforte and your team, and it's really my honor to deliver Montana's Labor Day report for 2024. Under the leadership of the Gianforte administration, the red tape initiative and pro-business policies, our economy has shown consistently strong growth and Montana is open for business. 
The state's workforce, as the governor said, is at an all-time high, unemployment remaining at an all-time low, and some of the strongest wage growth in the nation means even more money in the pockets of Montanans. As we look to the future, an essential ingredient in continued economic growth is ensuring that all of our businesses have access to a skilled and experienced workforce. Over 10,000 Montanans entered our workforce last year, a welcome sign for businesses who continue to struggle to find workers, but we know we still can continue to struggle to find workers in critical industries like construction, healthcare, technology, and education. What we found in the report this year is that construction and healthcare are projected to need uh, considerably more employees between now and 2032. Construction alone needs 1,000 new skilled workers every year from now till 2032, and healthcare needs 800 new skilled workers every year from now till 2032. The Montana Department of Labor and Industry is proud to continue our work upskilling and training Montanans to ensure that our economy continues growing. We continue to focus those efforts on public-private partnerships with business and industry to make sure that every Montanan has the opportunity to train for careers in high-wage, high-skilled jobs in whichever Montana community they choose to reside in. Our State Workforce Innovation Board continues leading engagement with stakeholders across the state, planning implementation of Montana's vast workforce investments, and the Montana Registered Apprenticeship Program continues enrolling new apprentices at record pace, with more than 3,000 active apprentices in our workforce today, with an over 95% retention rate for apprentices once they complete their apprenticeship, 95% retain with the employer that sponsored them through that apprenticeship five years later. Our Jobs for Montana Graduates High School and Middle School Curriculum Program continues to support those students, ensuring they have the competencies and skills necessary to find a job, to keep that job, and to quit that job the right way when it's time. Our network of 18 regional job service offices continues to meet the needs of employers and workers in every community in Montana. Our business engagement team continues meeting one-on-one -on -one with business leaders in every community in Montana, working with higher education and industry training partners to identify and solve workforce training gaps that employers are facing in real time. And our new education career exploration team is hard at work this fall, engaging directly with school officials and educators across the state, making sure that every one of our students has access to real time, high quality career awareness and exploration to ensure that every one of those students can live and work in the community of their choice. The Department of Labor and Industry will continue to focus our efforts, ensuring that Montana is adequately resourced to serve every worker in every community in Montana, including those underserved populations in our rural and our remote communities and those members in our tribal communities. But we need businesses to continue to join us at the table to increase career awareness, to improve skills-based training, and to ensure that every young person knows the opportunities available to them across Montana. I do want to take a moment to first thank the Department of Labor and Industry Economist team for their incredible work pulling together this year's Labor Day report led by our, our Chief Economist, Amy Watson. And I'd like to send an extra special thank you to Montana's workers. Thank you for what you've done this year, and thank you for your Montana work ethic. Day in and day out, it's your work that has driven Montana's economy to new highs, so thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, for your leadership. Um, as she mentioned, recognizing our need for more skilled workers, uh, we got to continue to work to remove unnecessary red tape that for too long has tied up employers uh, looking to build a more highly skilled workforce, increase apprenticeship opportunities, uh, and invest in the trades uh, and work-based learning opportunities for our students. Uh, working with the legislature and with Montana Business, we've made great progress and seen results when it comes to building a highly skilled, highly qualified workforce. Thanks to uh, construction and trades leaders like uh, Dave Smith and the Montana Contractors Association, we're working together to build a stronger workforce for the future of Montana. Uh, Dave, can you speak about the impacts of our investments have had on your businesses and your members? You bet. Thank you. Thank you, Governor and uh, Director Swanson. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm David Smith. I'm Executive Director of the Montana Contractors Association. 
Uh, we are a chapter of AGC of America, which is across the country. We build the highways, roads, hospitals, schools, and infrastructure for uh, our country. Uh, there are year over year 2,400 new construction jobs in the state of Montana since last July. There, that follows an 8% increase in 2022 and a 2% increase in 2023. In February of 2020, there were a little over 30,000 people employed in construction in the state of Montana. Today, there's over 39,000. It's almost a 30% increase in that time. One of the highest growth sectors of any uh, industry, uh, over 600 new establishments, and you mentioned the uh, average wage in Montana, but the average wage for a person employed in construction is over $67,000 a year. So there are, uh, there are problems ahead, though, uh, if we're not careful. And a survey of contractors across the West recently found that 96% uh, have craft positions open and available ready to hire today. There's over 77% that have salary positions open. 94% of contractors have difficulty hiring right now. The main uh, hourly positions that they're having trouble filling are equipment operators, mechanics, cement operators, and truck drivers. Over 75% of contractors are having problems filling those jobs. Uh, shortage of workers is causing over 62% of projects to be delayed. And interesting, they, they also reported uh, government regulations and lack of inspectors was over 50% of the delay cause. There's a variety of technic, technic, technical, excuse me, there's a variety of techniques that are being used right now by contractors to uh, improve and upskill their employers. And that's uh, through technology, third party trainers, and virtual reality. Pay rates have increased over 69% on average in the construction world in the last year. And 70% of contractors expect to hire more employees in the coming year. There's plenty of work to do. Uh, MDT has 1,200 bridges that need to be fixed. The average age of schools just here in Helena is over 60 years. And we have wastewater and water systems such as the St. Mary Diversion Dam that are in crisis mode. So there's plenty of work to do. And the most important thing I would say is that uh, this is not your grandfather's construction. This is construction that has drones, uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence, 3D building, and virtual reality. So uh, thank you for your focus on construction and uh, the uh, Montana Contractors Association. We're ready, ready for the call. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Let me just say, uh, I've been so impressed with your Build Montana program. It's really an innovative approach that creates workforce and solves the exact problem you were talking about, and we're proud to be a partner with you on that. Uh, it's played a huge role in attracting the next generation of construction workers. It's important work. Uh, the work you're doing changing lives and it's changing our state for the better so we appreciate it uh, thank you for your leadership as we've attested to today skilled trades and related industries are booming in Montana but we need the skilled and strong workforce to fill these jobs and serve our communities now more than ever Montana needs carpenters plumbers electricians welders masons and machinists now more than ever, Montana needs to invest in developing a highly skilled workforce uh, to build the future, uh, and we will continue to make progress. In conclusion, uh, I'm proud to stand alongside our partners today, both at DLI and the construction industry, uh, with a loud and clear message. Uh, Montana's economy is strong and growing, and Montana come, the Montana comeback continues. Thank you all for being here today. And with that, I'd be happy to open it up for some questions. Who would like to go first? Um, I can jump in. I'm wondering, I don't know if Sarah's going to see it too, but when we talk about some of the red tape initiatives that we saw last session and all since the led to the economy and where we're at right now, I know Governor talked about the apprenticeship ratio before, but are there other things you can point to from that red tape package that we saw in the last session or legislation we've seen over the last few months? Sir, do you need to start? Okay. Um, I think from the Department of Labor and Industries perspective, red tape relief has really allowed us to look at how we operate the department and how we serve Montanans. 
For example, uh, the legislature allowed us to do some creative moves to upgrade our weights and measures technology. In the past, when we had to send out a proofing truck to check a propane tank or a gas tank or a livestock scale, it was one truck dispatched from Glasgow to do each of those tasks, or excuse me, from Helena to communities like Glasgow to do each of those tasks. Now, thanks to the investment of the legislature and some of the red tape relief efforts, allowed us to put all of those proofers on one truck. So we send one inspector and one weights and measures uh, staff are out to those rural communities to do all of that work in one region. We can tell the same story across our building inspectors, our prevailing wage inspectors. All of them are hard at work cross-training now, whether they're inspecting a pharmacy or a funeral home or a prevailing wage job site, they're cross-training in one another's jobs. So we're maximizing the time of our staff spent behind a windshield so we can be more responsive to the needs of the business community and those projects that we need to inspect. Like Mr. Smith said, often some of the biggest delays on job sites previous to these red tape relief efforts were waiting on an inspector and we're working to improve that. Thanks to the red tape relief efforts. I think we can continue to improve, right? As the governor likes to say, better's always possible. The Department of Labor and Industry is a tremendously large agency. The number of programs under our, our roof is vast. And so whether we're looking at inspectors or occupational licensing, ensuring that we're keeping up with technology and that we're maximizing our resources uh, so that we're not the delay that the citizens and business industry are waiting on is really what we'll be focusing on. Uh, in short, our, our theme this session is capacity, 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 and serving the citizens better. What sort of things are you looking at? I saw the page in here on child training challenges that for those parents who are participating in the workforce. Do you have some measures last session to include some of the What should we be looking for? Some Certainly. Um, Amy Watson and our economy team leads our child care research. Do you want to talk about some of the work of that? In addition, um, I would just share with you that our business engagement team that I mentioned earlier in my remarks does include a dedicated dedicated staff member that focuses on child care in partnership with community schools and organizations, uh, ensuring that we're helping young people on their pathway to CDA credentials to join the industry. But Amy's team's really been at the forefront of research in the child care space. Sure. Yeah, so what I can say is, um, in that report, you'll find a quick summary of some of the major statistics that we produce at the Department of Labor to measure child care supply and demand and that capacity moving forward. We work with our partners at the Department of Health and Human Services to get information on licensed capacity for child care providers in the state and compare that to the demand for care. And what we found that in 2023, licensed child care capacity met about 44% of demand and about 60% of our counties are classified as a child care desert, meaning that um, supply meets less than a third of demand and so what we can say from that is that um, it does have significant workforce impacts and um, particularly for Montana parents of young children we see that there are about 66,000 Montana parents who aren't fully engaged in the workforce due to a lack of care and the need to um, care for their family. Um, certainly. So infant care is more significantly undersupplied. Uh, it meets about 34% of estimated demand. So nearly all of the counties in our state, uh, our state as a whole qualifies as a child care desert for infant care. So that would be care of children um, 18 months and younger. So what are some of the efforts? Yeah. So I, I think it's a really important question, Holly, uh, because as you yourself as a young mom, you know, it's a, it's a real need. And uh, the child care is really the workforce behind the workforce. Uh, we've made some significant progress already. Uh, first, in the licensure of child care to make it easier uh, to, to become licensed, we provided grants to help deal with some of the capital investments necessary to get child care started, particularly during the pandemic. And I think uh, the, at a, the conference we had in Bozeman here a few weeks ago, there were some really innovative solutions to child care that I think we're going to uh, work with our partners in the private sector to promote more broadly. Uh, based on a couple of changes that we made in the last legislature, we lowered the age for child care workers from 18 to 16. Uh, that opens the possibility of high school students now participating uh, and because of the workforce uh, 
the workplace learning experiences legislation that we passed in 2021 and expanded in 2023, uh, it opens up the opportunity for uh, high school students to actually work in childcare and get high school graduation credit for it if a local community decides that's something they want to do. Uh, we're seeing schools like the one in Huntley that's now providing childcare as an employee benefit to the teachers in the school. We have innovative companies like Zoot in Bozeman that are actually building childcare for their employees and then essentially selling slots to other local businesses so they can take advantage of their investment and it gets amortized across a larger group. So uh, we want to continue to work with these innovators and figure out where else the state might be creating friction uh, so that we can remove it. Uh, I, and I would just a follow on to your first question about where else in red tape we're looking. Um, red tape not only affects hiring workforce training, it also affects getting permits uh, to get started. When I came into office, we had almost 500 subdivision applications at DEQ that were past the statutory response times. Uh, by paying some overtime, a change in leadership, uh, that delay has been completely eliminated. Uh, we learned through our housing affordability task force that 40% of the cost of a new home is government regulations. Uh, by streamlining zoning, streamlining permitting, uh, having a better supply of workforce for the construction trades, uh, essentially allows us to increase supply and we're, seeing, we're starting to see results there. Of course, there's some industries that have seen a lot of growth. We're pulling up that average that we talked about. There are also some industries that have seen that negative growth, education and public administration moment, presumably the dominant by public sector employees. What are we doing to make sure that wages in the public sector keep up with you know, the, the full growth of inflation and growth in costs in the economy um, so the folks that work in those sectors can continue to do that? Yeah, I, it's a good point because when I came into office, uh, we had the lowest starting teacher pay in the country. Um, I sponsored the Teach Act, which I think in the first session we passed it in 2021, particularly focused on increasing average teacher pay. Uh, it's been effective. We had, I think, over 500 teachers in the state participate in that program the first year. We expanded funding for it in 2023. Uh, as the son of a teacher and the dad of a teacher, uh, we need to do a better job there. Uh, Teacher pay is set by local school boards. We want to provide the incentives for them to do the right thing, to have the best and the brightest in front of the classrooms. Uh, at the state level, uh, you know, we, uh, we were faced with record high inflation in large part because of federal policy. Uh, that's why our administration championed the pay package that we did in the last session. It really provided record level increases for state employees. It was a $1.50 an hour or 4% in each of the two years in the biennium. Uh, that particularly helped the lower wage people at the state level because uh, the $1.50 was a larger than 4% increase for them. Um, we have to, I think a worker is due their wages uh, and we have to be a good employer at the state as well. And I can't comment too much more because we're in the middle of our contract negotiations. I'm not going to, you're not going to get a number out of me. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, um, you you drank your fruit juice this morning or something, Holly. Um, since I've been in this job in, in Montana and reporting roles, we've seen the same picture here with tribal nations being left out of the news. What are your concerns talk about reason why you see that that's been persistent and if there's any legislation that you should be looking for or targeted for the various making sure that they're not being left behind and it's going to be stuff for tribal nations Well, it's a, a concern for me because you know, having a job and being self-sufficient brings dignity to the individual and it's an integral part of the American dream and that applies for all Montanans, whether they be native or non-native. Um, I continue to meet. I was just out in Lame Deer last week. I was met with the chairman of the Crow Tribe recently. I get to all the tribal council rooms every year um, and it needs to be a joint solution. Um, uh, in our business recruitment efforts, we've put particular focus on trying to recruit businesses into the state in areas adjacent 
to tribal communities. Uh, I think that's part of the solution, uh, but uh, the last thing the tribal governments want is the state to show up and say, this is what we think you ought to do. Uh, but we stand ready to be a partner, uh, and I continue to meet and have dialogue with them about the right way to grow jobs in Indian country. Yeah. Um, not yet. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, businesses in the pipeline. Uh, I think there are some communities that would be ideal for larger call centers uh, that could be in communities adjacent to tribal nations. And, uh, if, the, if that makes sense for that community, that could be a good thing. Good. Well, thank you for being here today, and happy Labor Day. Whoops. My microphone. Thanks for coming. Thank you.